Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Jack McCullough about working with psychopaths. Jack McCola, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have a conversation with you today on a really interesting topic. As we were preparing for this episode, you know, and, and shooting some ideas back and forth, you pitched the idea of talking about uh, psychopathy and about psychopaths that we deal with in our day to day life. And of course, that can happen, you know, in our our home life and the people we interact with in the community, but it also happens within the workplace. And, and we do work with people who would be labeled as a psychopath. And so we're going to explore that together and talk about how we can identify such individuals and how we can effectively work with individuals who may uh, fall along that spectrum of those types of, of behaviors and characteristics and attributes. As we get started, I wanted to share Jack's bio with everybody. Jack McCullough is a recognized thought leader in the world of strategic finance. He is the president of the CFO Leadership Council, a global professional society for senior financial executives. His first book, Secrets of Rockstar CFOs, was published in 2019 and has been recognized as one of the most influential books for finance chiefs. He is currently working on his second book, the the Psychopathic CEO, an, ex, an executive survival guide, which will help executives to identify a psychopath in the corner office and to develop a survival strategy for themselves and companies. He holds an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management and lives in Massachusetts with his wife and two teenage sons. Uh, super interesting. I love your, your uh, strategic finance background, but also how you're getting into this uh, area of surviving those difficult bosses. And of course, you're focusing on psychopaths. Um, but we could zoom out even a little bit, and just talk about those really difficult to work with bosses and, and CEOs. It'll be a fascinating conversation as we dive on into this. Before we do that, though, anything else you would like to share by way of background or personal context with listeners? Yeah, no. And thanks for that, that introduction. Just, you know, one question I get asked, since I do have a finance background, uh, why am I writing a book on psychopathy? And, you know, probably a legitimate question. And I will preface it by saying it's, it's not meant to be a medical book. It is a business book. Uh, so, but uh, I actually worked with a guy several years ago. As you might imagine, I'm going to remain nameless. But I caught, uh, he was running the sales organization for a company, at which I was a part-time CFO. And I found out there was a practice, all of the sales representatives were writing side letters. So there'd be a standard purchase order and reseller agreement that came to me and I'd sign it as an officer of the company. But then unbeknownst to me, they were writing a side letter giving the resellers a right to a refund. And I did not know that, discovered it. And when I told the head of sales, he just got um, furious with me. I mean, he just, I'll never forget like him sticking the, his finger, literally poking me in the chest. He was about this far from me face to face yelling over again, how dare you accuse these people, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I actually felt bad for him because I kind of knew I was right. But on the other hand, I thought this guy's as big a victim as me. I mean, this guy, he's totally, you know, defending his team and they're making him look bad. You know, so I had an IT person. I said, look, I need to prove this or disprove it. So, I, you know, unfortunately, I need to monitor some emails to find out how deep this goes. And it turned out the guy that denied it uh, was the one who actually orchestrated it. And he threatened people with termination if they didn't go along with it. And I, I just remember thinking like, Meryl Streep would not have given me a more convincing performance than this guy. She's got nothing on him. So anyway, you know, roll the clock a few years later and I'm in an event, the speaker is an FBI agent. 
And her particular expertise is psychopathy in the executive suite. And she's describing, I'm like, oh my God, I thought he was just a jerk, but this sounds a lot like that guy. And then towards the end, she said by a show of hands, how many people believe they may have worked for a psychopath at some point in their career? And about half of us raised our hands. And I'm like, in a way it was good and bad, right? I mean, the misery loves company thing, right? It, it's great to know I'm not the only one dealing with that. On the other hand, geez, if psychopaths have such a uh, in-depth um, dominant position in corporate America, we're gonna have some real problems down the road. So that's what inspired me to write the book. Well, that, that's super interesting. And we'll we'll get into definitions here in just a moment, uh, because I think that'll be helpful for listeners. You know, I think we're, we're all probably after you describe that we're all thinking um, about, you know, experiences we've had with certain um, co workers or with bosses. And, you know, would they be um, clinically diagnosed as a psychopath? Uh, so so we can get into that a little bit more uh, in just a moment. But yeah, it's it's just super interesting um, because th those difficult bosses do cause a lot of problems, a lot of angst, a lot of um, you know hardship for for their people. As you know, people are just trying to navigate organizational politics as it is, and then you add that extra layer um, onto it, and it, it's just such a challenge. So as we get started, let's let's talk with some definitions. Um, Let's start with some definitions. Can you help us define psychopathy and then talk a little bit about how prevalent it is? Sure. Uh, well, first, a lot of people can uh, compare it to um, psychotic uh, individuals, and they're very different. Psychotic people have lost touch with reality. Um, they, they don't really know what they're doing. They you know, might think whatever they might think. I, I would say even though their actions are evil, you might make an argument that psychotic is not evil because he or she sort of doesn't really understand the world that they're living in. So I'm trying not to defend it, but it's a little different. A, a psychopath, it's closer to like a sociopath or a Machiavellian or even a narcissist. But, you know, some of the big things they have is a complete lack of empathy. You exist solely for the benefit of the psychopath. And if you serve a role in his or her life, although it's usually a his, um, then they'll, you know, then they'll welcome you. But if not, they have no need for you. They tend to be a little bit reckless. There's a, a big thrill seeker element to a psychopath. They can be uh, very remorseless. They simply don't care. You know, if they, you know, close down a factory or something like that, it doesn't bother them as long as it benefits them. It needs to be done. Definite narcissistic traits. And again, the reckless type of unnecessary risks to a company or just even within their own personal life. And that can be anything from business decisions to interactions with their employees or whatever it might be. So if that helps with a good working. Yeah, I, I think that's helpful. And so how prevalent is it? It's an interesting question because it's not like, say, cancer or diabetes where you can, you know, get an accurate number. Um, the first attempt to uh, quantify it in a corporate setting was done by uh, Babiak and Hare. Uh, there's a, it's, a, a well-respected, one of the best books still, it's uh, Snakes and Suits. You may have heard of it. And they put it at 3.9%, but that was executives generally. Um, so in terms of just CEOs, there was a study last year by an Australian group that put it at 21%. Can you imagine? They did a study of American CEOs and concluded that 21% of them um, are probably psychotic. So, so, I mean, think about that. Anyone listening, think about one in five <laughs> um, of, of those CEOs out there that have uh, these, at least these, these kind of tendencies or characteristics, if not fully diagnosable <laughs> as a psychopath, um, you know, that's a, that's a tremendous number. So why do you think that is like if, if 3.5 ish, you know, maybe general population within managerial roles, um, why do you think it's such a high number uh, for senior executive leaders? Yeah, they're they're very drawn to it. They they want money. They want material things. I, a, a narcissist wants fame, but a psychopath doesn't necessarily want fame. There's a lot of ways to distinguish between the two, but one of them is a narcissist thinks he or she's better than you and wants you to know it. And a, a psychopath also thinks that he, he or she's better than you, doesn't really care if you know it or acknowledge it. But they're attracted to wealth uh, and, you know, 
So corporate America is a natural place for them. They're very manipulative. Um, they like to, you know, they, they kind of like having power over people. And unless you just have some incredible talent, like you're a world-class musician or something like that, then, um, you know, corporate America is a place where they can go and make some good money and influence and power and that sort of things. In fact, the most common jobs for a psychopath to have, uh, the first one is CEO. The second one is uh, media personality. The third is an attorney. And the, uh, I forget what the fourth one is, but um, some of the ones that are on the list are a little scary, like surgeon is seventh. You know, how, how would you like to know that your surgeon's a psychopath, right? If the guy shows up in a bad mood, he could remove your gallbladder or something when you're going in, uh, you know, for a completely different part of the body. So it's a little scary how prevalent they are. Prevalent they are. The other thing is a lot of the traits of psychopaths actually help them be successful in a corporate role. Uh, just for example, uh, go back to the one, let, let give you a hypothetical example, although it's, it's one that happens in the real world. Let's say you were the CEO of a company and there was a plant in the Midwest, the United States, you know, one of those old mill towns. It was underperforming. It just, it needed to go. You couldn't invest in modernizing. You needed, needed to cut it. But 60% of the people either in, in the town either worked for the plant or related to somebody who did. So if you were to close it, you'd not only, you know, hurt the people who worked there, you'd probably devastate an entire community. I, I bet you could do it, but I bet you'd, I bet it would take a long time to make that decision, right? You'd bring in consultants, you'd maybe bring in some training, look into some investment of how you can modernize, whatever it might be, and you might waste two, three months delaying the inevitable. Psychopath would do it in about five minutes. And it doesn't make them a better human being than you, but in that circumstance, it might make them a more effective CEO because they can just make a decision, execute it. And by the way, they don't care. They're not gonna look back on it, right? Yeah, so 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 they they it it appears that they're just very decisive, willing to make the hard decisions. Um, they don't they don't suffer from um, you know what often happens with with certain leaders and executives uh, where they, they just have this they're just paralyzed by decision making, right? Mm -hmm. uh, decision paralysis, and uh, and so that that can be a good trait at times, right? Uh, to to the point that you just made, uh, but at other times we really. Well, I, I would hope that most leaders would take into account the human costs, the community costs, the, the, the externalities associated with the decisions that they're making. And in fact, when we talk about moral and ethical decision making within a corporate setting, that, those are the types of things that we talk about, the importance of uh, taking into account the impacts on others around us in this idea of doing no harm and, and benefiting um, our communities and and creating sustainable um, outcomes, you know, that are positive for communities, for the environment, for our people. And, you know, if one in five CEOs are psychopaths, they simply just don't care about those sorts of things, do they? I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. They don't. Now, on the other hand, they may pretend to care. 
Um, and one of the things about them, another thing that makes them so successful is they're highly skilled actors. Uh, you know, they can, um, they can sort of adopt whatever role they need to succeed in a company and in an industry. And, you know, if their success will be determined by pretending to have a philanthropic bent, they'll go for it. Um, it's interesting. I, I interviewed one person who um, told me that he was certified as a psychopath. And I, I, I was aware of the possibility I was being played, but I, I don't think I was. And uh, he compared his role as a CEO, like getting a CEO job and exceeding it to online dating, which, you know, I, I've been out of the game before that existed, but he said, suppose you see an attractive woman uh, and she claims that she likes walks in the woods, French food and travel to the Caribbean. I want to meet her. So I'm actually going to change my profile to say that I like those three things too. To him, it's the exact same thing. He'll play whatever role he needs to get the CEO job that he wants. And uh, he will, you know, just sort of play that role as long as he wants to. And what's interesting is we made it really easy for him. Because when you think about it, you go to almost any company website, you can find out an awful lot about the company culture. Uh, you can read about their code of ethics, uh, even the job descriptions that describes the personality characteristics that they're looking for. So, you know, let's pretend I'm a psychopath and you're not, and we're applying for the same job and you have seven out of the 10, I have none of the 10, but I'm a gifted actor and I'm going to pretend that I have all of them. I'm probably going to, you know, cut you in line, even though I don't really deserve to be just based upon my acting skills. So, and what's funny, I interviewed a couple of people um, for the book and I, I didn't want to bias them. My, my intent was not to deceive them. I didn't tell them explicitly what the book was about because I didn't want them. I, I just didn't want to bias their answers. I told them it was a leadership book. And so I was sort of asking, you know, what is it that you value in a leader? And, or, you know, who are some of the good ones? And one guy, he described, he met a guy playing pickup, a pickup basketball game. And he said he was fighting for a rebound. Uh, and he, uh, like he, he was struggling for a rebound and he, he punched the guy in the face to get the rebound. And he said, uh, that's the type of guy I want on my team. And uh, he also said this like, um, he punches grandmother in the nose to close a deal as though it's a good thing, right? And, you know, they didn't know that they were actually describing, you know, a psychopath or a near psychopath to me, so. It was very interesting and enlightening conversations uh, that I had with people. In, in yeah, yeah. Well, that's super interesting. So I guess the question is, I mean, if they're really good actors and they see that there's a benefit to to them um, coming across as caring, coming across as mindful of the community and, you know, the PR spin and just they, they, they want to in order to be successful, they want to be seen as, you know, um, that figurehead of the organization that people look up to, you know, in, in that sense, it, I suppose it's a good thing, or it could be turned into a good thing, because it's driving, you know, hopefully good behaviors based on their desires, right? So even though their their motives are maybe not pure, their behaviors might be in line with what we would hope to see from a great leader. Um, and I suppose that's, you know, I, I don't really care so much what's going on in someone's head as long as they behave well and uh, act well to others. And so that that's one interesting standpoint, but or one perspective. But another way to look at it too is, you know, what do you do when you just have the the psychopath boss who literally doesn't care and doesn't try to play the role of like a good boss, doesn't try to play the role of of someone who does you know, look out, you know, ha has a, a moral compass, has integrity, looks out for their people and such. Um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's an interesting. And I, I'll, I'll get to that. One thing I want to point out to you, you mentioned, you know, some CEOs are successful. And, you know, in the course of doing the research, I, I was curious, you know, famous CEOs who may be psychopaths. And, uh, you know, one name that came up a lot, and unfortunately, he's passed away, but Steve Jobs, right? I mean, founder of Apple Computer, one of the most significant companies in history, certainly of our lifetime. Uh, he's made some incredible technological advances and the world is a better place because of him. And that I know of, he didn't break any laws during the course of his career. And you know, I, I think most people would say he was an ethical business leader. Apple's a charitable company, but he's also a guy, I mean, you know, he would humiliate employees in public, which psychopaths are notorious for do. 
he fired one of his people at one of those Apple conferences in front of the whole world, Apple world, I think it's called. Uh, and then sort of his jerk behavior, he you know would park in handicapped spots. Um, he had a daughter that wasn't, you know, some outside of marriage. She lived in poverty, he wouldn't give her any money. Uh, they apparently patched it up when she got became an adult, but he totally denied her existence for years. Um, in some sense, he, although most strangely, he would actually soak his feet in uh, at the office. He would actually take his shoes and socks off, soak his feet in the toilet, which is you know perhaps more weird than psychopathic. But you know he checks a lot of the boxes. And let me ask you: Would you work for him, Jonathan? Oh, from from what I know about him, from what I've read and and heard, uh, he would not be the ideal boss for me. <laughs> yeah, maybe not, right? But another guy, I personally don't believe he's a psychopath. I just think he's demanding. Uh, but you know, other people have mentioned that he displays some of the traits, and he does. But Elon Musk, yeah, uh, you know, there's, I would, you know, if you could stand working for Elon Musk, and you know, he's very demanding, and you know, he'll yell at you if you screw up and that type of thing. You know, you'd uh, you'd learn more from him in six months than you might in two years getting a master's degree, I would think, right? But yeah, definitely not for everybody. So, but yeah. Um, so, you know, getting back, you know, what to do if you're faced with a psychopath who is actually a bad person, you know, and is acting badly. Um, you know, a few things. One thing they do when they meet people, they're um, they're building their tribe. So the minute a psychopath meets you, they're sizing you up as a friend or an ally, and they're learning everything about you. And by the way, they can change you to a different bucket or to no bucket at all right away. Um, but they've got a mental catalog of you, and anything you share with them, they're going to use against you if they can. I'll give you an example. There was a CFO I, uh, that I worked with. He kind of later concluded that maybe the guy was a psychopath, but his, um, his son had cancer, and he disclosed this to the CEO. And it was just, he thought it was just two work friends chatting more than anything. And he kind of had it under control. Well, the CEO banked that little bit of information and he went to the board and he said, hey, I don't, don't know if you guys are aware of this, but you know, Frank's, um, Frank's son has cancer. So he needs us some, our support. If he needs a little flexibility, uh, you know, we need to give it to him, blah, blah, blah. And that seemed like a good guy, right? He's getting the board to take care of him their relationship soured and the CEO decided to fire Frank, which of course, as you might imagine, not his real name. So he went to the board and he pretended to still be concerned. Like, look, his son's gotten a lot worse. For his own good, we need to fire him and give him a generous severance package. His family needs him. He doesn't need the distraction of a job. And they fired a CFO that was performing well, just because the CEO viewed him as a threat and it was a painless way to get rid of him. So if you're going to take on a CEO who's, who may be a psychopath, try as best you can remember everything that you talked about him because he, he remembers it and he's going to use it against you if he can. Uh, the other thing is, you know, understand yourself and understand the mind of a psychopath. Uh, they don't want to play fair. They want to win. And in their mind, the fight's not over until they've won. Keep that in mind. This, this could be a very long fight that that might last beyond the length of your employment relationship. Uh, the other thing, document everything that you can. Um, it, you know, everything that might go wrong, you know, record it. By the way, record it on your home email because uh, there's a very good chance the psychopath has access to your email. Um, they, if they suspect that you're plotting against them, they're gonna go to the IT person, they're gonna get them as part of their tribe, and they're going to get access to your email, and there's nothing you can do about it. You'll, you'll not know it. Uh, the other thing is avoid the diagnosis and focus on the behavior. First of all, you know, if you call the person a psychopath, you know, you're not qualified to make that diagnosis. I'm writing a book on the topic, and I don't feel like I'm qualified to write it. I think I can help people identify the characteristics of it. But I, when you get right down to it, I'm not qualified to diagnose a psychopath. So avoid the label, but focus on what they did and why it's bad for the company. And then, uh, you know, I'd also say, just do your job extraordinarily well, be invaluable to the board. It's really tough to fire somebody who's good at his or her job, right? And then I guess the last one is know when to quit. You know, uh, maybe the job's not worth it if this person is gonna make you miserable. 
or make your family miserable or your employees miserable. So. Yeah. Yeah. And as you were going through those, those pointers, you know, that, that was the, the one I was thinking about and you brought it up last, but you know, sometimes you just got to be willing to walk away. And, and I think it's, it's really important for us to, to have, you know, prepare ourselves and, and, and have different options so that if we either find ourselves in a situation that we just don't feel comfortable with, you know, ethically, morally, or we're working with people, it's an untenable situation. Uh, it's going to negatively impact our, our personal life, our home life, our family life. Um, you know, there are times you just need to walk away. And there are other times where, you know, you want to put up the good fight. Um, there's other times you want to just kind of make do. Uh, I'm not here to tell anyone, you know, what that is for them, you know, it depends on your circumstances, right? But I think having having the ability to walk away um, will ease a lot of of strain and tension if you're dealing with that kind of um, a, a situation yeah. with a boss. Mm -hmm. And like you said, ultimately we can't diagnose it. But you know, I'm thinking about um, I, I've had probably a bunch of bad bosses, but there's only one or two that I I'm suspicious um, that they might have uh, been psychopaths. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter, though, whether they were diagnosable as a psychopath or not, their behaviors clearly were problematic. And I'm glad I don't have to deal with them ever again. And I don't want to ever deal with um, anyone like that again, if I can help it. Um, so ultimately, I have to, you know, manage my career in such a way that I'm I can make those choices if and when uh, the need arises. Right. I mean, yeah, far be it for me to, to tell somebody to quit or when to quit or why to quit, but it's a battle you'll probably lose because the war may have started three years before you're even aware of it. And uh, yeah, and the oh, you, you you mentioned something earlier about power being and now. Certainly, psychopaths aren't the only ones who are drawn to power, um, but it there is a long game there with their consolidation and control of of power, and 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 so. Ultimately, you, you have to decide if that's something you want to, to deal with on an ongoing basis. It could be for years. And like you said, it could be something you're completely unaware of that started before you, you know, your awareness of a bad situation. So uh, we just have to balance all of those things. Well, Jack, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. What a fascinating topic and discussion. I really am looking forward to your book when it comes out so I can read more about this. Before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your book, uh, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. And my day job, I'm the president of the CFO Leadership Council, which is a professional association for CFOs and their teams. And you can certainly send me an email there to jack at cfolc.com. Or uh, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, my email, uh, my LinkedIn handle, is that what it's called? I don't even know. It's simply Jack McCullough CFO at LinkedIn. Love to connect with people and we can follow each other and start a dialogue that way as well. So, uh, but thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been great. And uh, hopefully we can do it again when the books come out, comes out and, and I can give you some of the reaction from some of my readers. Perfect. Thank you, Jack. It's a, been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what, what Jack can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.